Yes, I, I know we have a few of you popping in on here. We're going to give it about a minute before we actually uh, start. So if you have any questions ahead of time, there's a Q&A section uh, in here that you can put your questions in the Q&A. But we'll, we'll probably get started in about a minute. Sounds good. Trina, I got to be out of here by uh, 6.15 on the yep. dot, okay? Yep. And I'm just making sure my settings on my phone are on mute. So we don't have any interruptions. <laughs> Good. Okay. So it looks like we've kind of uh, settled in with the attendee, the participants so far. So why don't we get started? Um, uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Shane Varga. I cover the western half of uh, the U.S. Um, I'm excited that uh, we have been here doing this uh, train session because I think implementation is such a big part of being able to maximize your T scan. Uh, Ben's had T scan since 2007, 2009. Yeah, I think it was either eight or nine. Uh, so he's been using it for a while, but what you'll get a chance to hear as well as how his journey of how he started using T-Scan versus how he's using the T-Scan right now. So just to get a couple of things out of the way first, if you have any questions, we're gonna answer questions at the very end. So the last 15 minutes of it, there is a Q&A section on here that um, I'll, I'll type in uh, something in the Q&A section so that you can kind of see where that's at. But there's a Q&A section where you can put in any questions that you have. And I also believe that there's going to be a poll or a survey at the very end um, once we close out uh, and stop the recording here. That will ask you a few questions. So if anybody that's here can take a minute or two to answer those questions, uh, we would really appreciate that. So without further ado, I'll let... Uh, Dr. Sutter um, introduce himself a little bit more and uh, get started here. Aren't we having a Christmas raffle where T Scan is going to raffle off a, a <laughs> handle to a non user? You're Isn't not that allowed what Jim to be promised in, already. <laughs> uh, you have to add, you have to ask Jen that one. <laughs> yeah, I probably just did my last uh, Tech Scan webinar. Uh huh. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to. Um, I don't want to waste any real estate, so I'm going to, how do I turn off? Yeah, I was just going to turn off my my uh, my camera, but I'm going to just hide it. And so you guys can do the same thing because uh, I want to be able, I want you to be able to see as much of the screen as possible. So let's go ahead and get this started. Um, uh, it, Somebody always asks, and I always forget uh, when we get towards the end, my contact information. Uh, best way to get a hold of me is through, um, I'm old school, very uh, old school, America Online. Um, uh, the millennials are like, what is that? And that was before when we had dial up modems and you had to listen to all that crazy noise. And then you can also reach out to me on Facebook Messenger uh, uh, as well. That seems to be the the two main uh, routes that people use to get a hold of me. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is comprehensive dentistry using the T-Scan digital occlusal analysis system. In other words, how um, how am I using this in everyday bread and butter dentistry? And um, the the big thing is how are you billing for it? That seems to be uh, one of the big questions. Um, and the other question is like, I don't know who I would use this on. 
and uh, you know, I don't do full mouth cases. And while you're going to use it on every single person that you take an x-ray on and um, do periodontal probing on because you're responsible for the occlusion. And the nice thing about it is just like taking an x-ray or doing a perio probing chart is it gives you a baseline and it helps patients own their own problems. And the great thing about it for you is when the patient comes in and they break a tooth and it's always because, oh, I was just eating a piece of cheese, doc. I don't, I wasn't eating anything crazy. Well, the reason that tooth broke is because it's been overloaded for 15 years and it's no surprise. And so you get to have the aha moment of, well, now we have to fix that with a crown because uh, you broke off a, you know, a third of the, you know, cusp of the tooth. And then how do we prevent this from happening in the, in the beginnings, uh, you know, before, uh, after you fix it and you have patients attention on, Hey, these are some of the things that we really need to be watch out, watch out for. So, um, yeah, this is, a, a, a truncated version of a, of a course that I gave in, in Vancouver, uh, Canada, um, last month. Let's go ahead and get this thing started. And so I'm from, uh, uh, Oregon. Uh, well, I'm here. I'm actually from Dallas, Texas, but I'm a big national parks fan and a photography buff. Uh, so this is Crater Lake, um, which is an imploded uh, volcano. And what you're looking at here is the caldera. Uh, but this is a, a nighttime picture that I took. I just wanted to share uh, occlusion and, and, and TMJ are not my only passions, but uh, photography certainly is up there at the top. So I wanna give one disclaimer. I'm not a paid consultant for any dental materials or technology company, nor do I get paid if you buy any of the products I use. I am a private practice owner that shares data and discoveries revealed from learning and using multiple ways of treating problems that most dentists avoid. And that's occlusion and TMD. Most of our occlusion is conformative in the way that we try to make our restorations fit what the patient always uh, already has. And that doesn't always um, work out the way we think it does because I have a very successful practice um, fixing um, dentistry that's been delivered unmeasured. And the tap, tap, tap on the paper is only about 13% accurate. And I know most of you are thinking, that's not me. Um, I'm, uh, I'm good at deciphering what those bite paper marks mean. And no, you're not. And um, Neither am I, which is the reason why I use a T-scan. And so we'll go through some of that uh, some of that tonight too. So where did this get started, right? Um, I had a, a lady who came in and she presented with these two crowns on um, 31 and 18. And she was getting ready to retire and she was going to lose her, um, her insurance benefit. And she said, hey, doc, you know, I don't have a problem chewing. There's no no real issues, um, but they're kind of unsightly and I'd like to get these fixed before I retire and let's use some of my insurance benefit. I'm like, okay, for sure, let's do that. So um, I cut off both crowns and she comes back in two weeks and uh, is getting fitted for the, um, the finals. And uh, she grabs my hand and said, you know, you saved my life. And I'm like, well, you know, I kind of blew her off at first. And she's like, no, you need to listen to me, what I'm telling you. I used to wake up with headaches and migraines for the last, uh, you know, seven, eight years. And the day after you cut those two crowns on, I didn't have any, uh, cut those crowns off. I no longer had that pain anymore. And so that really started my interest in occlusion. Um, and so maybe I ought to start paying attention to this and what some of my patients are telling me. So that's where we started down the road of um, discovery. And because if, you, if your school was anything like mine and I went to a Rutgers School of Dental Medicine, um, uh, occlusion just wasn't taught that good. And I would imagine in the well, 17 years that I've been out, it hasn't improved any. Um, so Tech scan, if occlusion is a religion, T scan is the Rosetta Stone. It tells us things we there's no way you're going to find out any other way. So 
Well, look at this. We got traditional findings, and we know that it, uh, occlusion can affect root fractures, uh, bone loss and recession, ab fractions, uh, bone loss around implants. Uh, we already talked about uh, broken teeth that you know are going to need a, you know, uh, a crown um, uh, to restore, and then um, tooth wear and rotation or shifting of teeth, but. <clears throat> In my office, I'm sought out for uh, second opinions on all of these different diagnoses, and we're not going to go into this. And it's not about uh, you know a pain a pain webinar, but I couldn't do what I do with these patients without having the data from uh, the T scan. And then finally, uh, you know, when occlusion gets uh, corrected, all of a sudden all sorts of things start to improve. Um, and uh, this one right here at the very bottom, this temperature sensitivity um, for sensitive teeth, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, and when we do, when we do uh, two day and one day courses, we go over how this is impacting teeth. And when you unload them, all of a sudden they're not sensitive. This is a great, uh, service to provide your patients with, okay? And all of this is governed by teeth surface interactions from the top to the bottom, right? So the nice thing about the technology is it doesn't really care um, where you put your philosophical occlusal discipline at. Like if you're LVI, uh, and I'm an LVI fellow, or, you, or you're a Coist guy, or you're a Panky woman, or a Spear Doc, or Dawson, it really doesn't matter. We all want the best for our patients. And they're going to tell you three things among all of these different um, um, postdoctoral instructional facilities are going to agree that the bite needs to be balanced right and left, 50-50, plus or minus. You want to make sure that no one tooth is is overloaded or bearing its unfair share of occlusal force. And then interferences are not a good thing. They all agree on it and it's on in every single textbook. Now how you get there might be different, but you know, some of these courses or some of these continuums put more weight on uh, T-scan than others. And um, that there's a, there's a lot to be said for that. And we can go into the politics and you know, the what ifs and how comes and spend a whole day on that. But um, the three things that they all agree on, T-Scan is going to help you with uh, along the way. So um, in my career, I never wanted to deal with oral facial pain patients and was never really concerned with occlusion, just make it fit, right? I mean, that's what we were all taught. And um, the patient's going to help guide you, right? Well, that's absolutely wrong the proprioception of some patients varies differently and what some patients will tolerate versus others is uh, uh, on, a, on a huge spectrum. And so um, a lot of the, the papers that I've written and my contribution to this textbook, I, I wrote one of the chapters, is based on uh, probably about 10 years of having T-scan clinically. And so you're going to get the benefit of some of this today. This is my background in occlusion. Uh, I've tried a number of things where I have gone, learned an entire curriculum or two, or completed coursework, gone back to my office, measured everything with biometrics. And when I mean everything, I mean everything that's measurable from posture to um, you know, a cold sensitivity to uh, sway onto um, range of motion and uh, so on and so forth. And so, you know, I am, I'm coming at you with um, a dec more than a, about a decade and a half of biometrics and measuring things that uh, most of the profession is ignorant of, but let's just keep on trucking. So how do I use T-Scan? Well, there it is. I started in 2009, and uh, originally I got it for TMD cases in all of my cosmetic cases because I really wanted to be a uh, cosmetic dentist. I thought that was awesome to give people their smile back. And then um, I started learning that uh, a lot of the um, 
problems with sore spots and dentures were actually occlusion problems. And I could never seem to get that right. Um, and then uh, some more time passed and uh, had some implants that failed. You're gonna see a case of one of my implant failures uh, a little later. And um, all implants need to be measured to make sure that they're not overloaded. You know, we, we would lose implants because bone was heating up and we figured that out. We turned the drill down and we started to irrigate it with saline and that took care of that problem. And then we figured out, well, you know, we're losing implants because we have all this plaque retention because there's too much cement on the crown that you're inserting on the implant. And then dentistry got that figured out. And now we have uh, a random uh, peri-implantitis where this patient has no bone loss anywhere else except your implant. Guess what? That implant is overloaded uh, nine times out of 10. It's, uh, it's, it's not driven by um, uh, biofilm. And then um, a couple of cases where I had patients tell me, you know, the bite is perfect. You don't need to do anything uh, to adjust it. And then I'm like, oh, wow, perfect. Really, that, that really means something to me. Let me get the T-scan out. I want to see what perfect means. And uh, that's when I started coming to, the, uh, to observe that patients are really poor historians about figuring out where the bite really needs to be and um, uh, started uh, looking at uh, every indirect restoration uh, that I was installing and delivering in patients. And then it, it gradually also at the same time, I started taking baseline scans on all patients coming into, coming into my office. And it's great, you know, I think it was uh, Bill Blatchford that said that what which gets treatment plan gets produced in other words if you don't diagnose it you're never going to produce it and the patients a lot of times will feel like oh my bite feels uh my bite feels fine there's nothing wrong with it and then you present the data and all of a sudden it's it's almost like you know showing them a picture of a tooth with an modbl amalgam with five fractures in it and they're like whoa is that in my mouth they get it t-scan does a wonderful job of this color and height of the pixels in um, kind of making sure patients understand exactly what you see. It's very intuitive. Um, and so what I ended up doing was getting a second handle for hygiene room because all of my patients come in through hygiene. And I'm at the point now where so many of my patients are expecting to have their bite checked when they come through the office. Uh, and we do that gratefully, and it actually impacts and produces more dentistry. Um, you would think that it wouldn't because, well, if, if, I, if the tooth doesn't break, then I'm doing less crowns. Yeah, that, that's uh, counterintuitive. It, that, that doesn't actually hold water. And then also um, emergency exams. If somebody comes in with a tooth that doesn't feel right, uh, especially new patients, uh, we put the T-scan in, uh, in, in our limited exam. We added that just to make sure that it's not some transient uh, hyperocclusion thing uh, going on. So here it is. Here's uh, here's the, the readout that I was telling you about, right? Let me just um, get down here to, I don't know if you guys can see this, but I'm going to grab the laser pointer. Now I know you can see this. So um, real quick, I'm going to spend a little time on this just so people, if people are familiar with tech scan or the, the T-scan technology, but are not really comfortable with the data or how to read it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how this can translate very well into doing occlusal therapy or making sure that what you deliver is not going to irritate the patient and waste chair time while you're, you're trying to get the bite right. So let's take a look at this. You have the patient uh, bite into the sensor and um, and you have the sensitivity, you want that set on two to three pink pixels, which I have three, I have two here and one here. And um, uh, I have, I, I'm doing a right excursive movement on, uh, on this particular patient, but between B and C is uh, our clinch, our sustained clinch. I have the, the data is being recorded, the teeth aren't, they're separated, they're not coming together. And then right here, I tell the patient to bite down, clinch, and they do that. 
and the black line is total bite force, and you see it goes to 100%. This patient's able to sustain the clench, and then I tell them to move, shift to the right, and that's what you see the, the black line's going down. The force is decreasing as we're moving and shifting in this direction, okay? Now, um, you might have heard of disclusion time. That's your distance between C and D. And then your occlusion time, the amount of time it takes your teeth to come together is the time between A and B. So here we have total force on this axis of the graph. And then down here, we have time in seconds. So you can tell exactly how long it takes for teeth to come together or for teeth to come apart when you're doing these uh, these uh, recordings with your patient. So the thing that stands out to me, if I don't know anything about T-Scan, there are two things that stand out right away. This big uh, mess back here and this number distribution of 60, 40. Okay, so what does this all mean? So the technology is going to record the amount of bite force on any tooth and um, right and left, okay? So the patient's total bite force on the right is 60% and 40% on the left. Now, we want this to be 50-50, uh, of course, uh, plus or minus five degrees. So there's some variability, and as long as you're, it's kind of like a temperature, you know, you can be too high, you can be too low, but as long as you're in this range, um, you're okay, and the body really doesn't care. And I would say the same thing about occlusion. As long as we, you're within five percentage points right and left, I think, you're, I think you're okay. And most of the patients who we do treatment on, once you achieve that goal, symptoms abate pretty quickly. The, the other thing that I like about this is each one of these squares represents a tooth, right? And this is our, this is our maxillary arch. And you can, make, you can look at this and from the maxillary or the mandibular, it doesn't really matter. But... 20% of our bite force is on one tooth, okay? Well, just looking at teeth, I mean, the teeth look like they come together just fine. Um, but the, the fact that this patient has a fifth of their total bite force on one tooth, that's concerning. So as a, as a doc, I might say something like, you know, uh, you, you really don't have any periodontal disease. We're gonna put you in a, a cleaning program and um, don't really have any decay. However, I'm expecting problems with this because this tooth is overloaded. And then you'll hear anything from, oh, I really don't even notice that my bite is off. Or you might hear like, oh, well, you know, a previous dentist uh, did this tooth five years ago and I went back like three or four times and had it adjusted and it's still not right. Uh, and that's a testimony to how accurate those bite marks are, which is about 13%, by the way. Um, you also, down here, you have a, uh, a sensitivity of the intensity of each one of these pressure points, right? So you have two things. You have 256 levels of occlusion that is brought to your attention in two different ways, color and the height of these pixels. So the smaller the pixel, like this guy right here, we're at the low end of the spectrum. This is a very dark blue, so it's tiny intensity. And then in the middle, we have green, and you can see there's green here and then yellow orange and red are high and we have plenty of yellow orange there's one red and then pink is so high the machine can't read the data it's a it's a force of unknown quantity okay and then they cut the height of the uh, pixels uh, off they only go to this high but in reality if it was kept um, in sequence with all of the other pixels you know the, the force value could be here the, the pink pixels could be this tall or it could be this tall, or it could be on the ceiling, you know, for our, all we know. But this is a nice compact way to evaluate all of that. Okay, the other thing that we have is the center of force icon, which is this guy right here, this little uh, white and red kite square looking thing. What is this? This is a summation of all of these data points, okay? And think about it um, like a bubble and a level. It goes right and left, it goes front and back. And um, if you're sitting right on the crosshairs, you know that the bite is balanced, okay? 
still got to look at the individual numbers because you could have 50% of their bite force on one tooth and then, you know, 50% uh, kind of distributed among multiple teeth over here. And that would not be an acceptable uh, distribution profile. The other thing that it shows you is where it uh, has been. So, you know, early on, and this is quadrant view. So let me explain this. Um, in each one of these quadrants, we have a different color that correlates to a line down here, okay? So you have blue, red, green, yellow, red, blue, green, and yellow, all right? And you can see that 50% of total bite force um, is coming from the blue quadrant. And yeah, that was just a guess. I wasn't off by much, but it's in between 40 and 60 um, uh, total max force, which is here, all right? So um, you can tell that the patient hits first on number eight. And then as they bring their teeth together, the back teeth come together, right? And that's what this is, this, that's what this is showing. And so you can also see it down here graphically. The patient hits in the red quadrant, which is here. And then as their teeth come together, they can sustain a clinch. And each one of these lines, correlates to each one of these numbers. And so when I had the patient go to the right, you would expect if they had good canine guidance that this center of force icon would go straight to six and everything else would come apart, right? That's not what happens. She has working interferences because if we're going to the right, she's gonna probably uh, tooth number two, uh, tooth number two and 31, is what this is right here. And then also has non-working interferences as she's going to the right. That's what the, the, the gold or this yellow line is indicating force over here. And she's got some anterior guidance because you see the red go up and then it drops down uh, to zero, all right? So this is mid-treatment with this patient. And there are some boxes that we can check off in our evaluation. So keep in mind that I haven't changed the sensitivity at all, okay? The, the change that you're seeing is actual um, a result of how the bite is being altered, okay? And you can see she's, she's uh, within five percentage points, which I said was, which was good, right? The center of force icon is not way out over here. It's sitting on the uh, horizontal and vertical lines. And you don't have this long drag from, the, from tooth number two down. She's having bilateral simultaneity, which means all these teeth are touching at the same time and increase in force is going up symmetrically across all the teeth because uh, all of the bite force uh, or the, the center of force icon never leaves this target zone, okay? So we can check off a lot of boxes of things that we, uh, we want in a good stable bite. The last thing is uh, working and non-working interferences. You see the green line go up and she is going to the left. That's how this is saved, right? So you would expect your center of force icon to go right up to 11 if she has canine guidance and everything else falls off. Now she does um, go, uh, the, the green line does go up uh, indicative of the force the change going in that direction, but she's also got a working interference, which is probably this guy right here, okay? Um, this woman was complaining of uh, inner ear issues. And if anybody would take a guess, is it the right ear or the left? It's actually the right ear that had the problems, right? So, um, you know, the strange thing about the patients that, that come into my office is it's not just all about teeth, there are consequences um, and benef benefits to getting the bite right or not doing anything with it, right? Okay, so one of the other things that are a uh, uh, kind of a plus um, with um, T-Scan T -scan 9 and a big improvement in T-Scan Software 10 is being able to put your STL files. This is my STL file, and you can superimpose your T-Scan data right on top of the STL file, and I'll do that here. And you can see where these problems are and where they're gonna be located on the STL file, right? 
pink's not inherently bad per se. This is a, a really good setting, but you know, I hit in the front and then I kind of swing around down here. I'm not off much 50-50 um, wise right and left, but um, uh, yeah, this is not a, this is not an excursive. This is just a three different bites of me biting into MIP. And I do, um, the reason why I do this is to make sure that I'm getting the consistent bite from patient to patient. In other words, and it's interesting because you see me hitting first on the, on the left side. Um, I'm not he heavily uh, on the right side and then the left side takes over and then I sustain a clinch. And you'll see this little crossover on all three of these bites. You also see that I'm slightly heavier on the right side than the left and consistent among all of these bites because the red line is, which is a correlates with the right, is on, on top of or higher than the green line, which correlates to the left. So this is how you make sure patients not giving you a crazy bite. How often do you, you know, there's all sorts of jokes and memes on the internet about asking a patient to bite down for you. And they're kind of edge to edge way out here in the front, like they're going to bite a carrot. And you're like, no, no, that's not what I want. So this is a great way to make sure that you're getting good data. Okay. And so, you know, one of the great things about being in the tech, um, the information age is, um, uh, is the technology brings so much to us. Okay. And um, really to not have it, uh, ignorance is a choice. Um, and there's a little bit of a learning, uh, uh, a learning curve with new technology. It doesn't matter what it is, but TechScan itself is not, um, is not impossible to learn. Um, uh, where you get the real benefit out of this and where you shine is with clinical training. And we'll get to that later. But you have so many opportunity and as, as technology gets better and better, the gap between what was acceptable becomes wider and wider. So, you know, like if you look at Galileo's technology um, and these four moons, you can only see three around Jupiter are named after him because uh, he was the first one to discover that Jupiter had four moons. Well, Jupiter's got 63 moons and 13 of them aren't even, aren't even uh, named yet. They just have numbers and letter symbols. And it wasn't that Galileo was lying to us, uh, but he was limited in his observations by the technology he was using, right? So now we have Hubble and we've been using Hubble for, I think, uh, 15, 20 years. And they just upgraded to the James Webb. So, you know, this is becoming obsolete, but the leap from here to here was amazing, right? We could see all sorts of things. And I'm, as a photographer, I'm really excited to see what uh, James Webb is going to start producing here in short order. So technology gives us uh, diagnostics and understanding because it gives us data. So if you take something like uh, cardiology out of, out of medicine, we have cardiac enzyme tests, you have uh, echocardiogram, fluoroscopy, stress tests, uh, 16 lead EKG, there's all of these are used to improve function. Now, in dentistry, we have, uh, we have x-rays and we have certainly made some improvements on our x-rays in recent years, but we have a notch stick and we have some bite paper. That's our technology. And none of this, zero, improves function. None of it does. So it's not a hard stretch to... To wonder why why aren't why don't dentists have the same you know respect that the medical doctors and the reality is you guys can do things they just can't and um, uh, I don't want to get too far down uh, oral facial pain uh, uh, tunnel <coughs> but that's true and if any of you all have seen some of the DTR videos you know that to be uh, true so let's go over um, some cases this is how I use it. so. Uh, Jessica is a brand new patient. Her parents are both in my practice for decades. Jessica is now 18 years old, so she's leaving the folds of the um, pediatric dentist, and she's uh, transferred to the adult office. And because she's 18, we have brand new teeth in there. There's no decay. She doesn't have any symptoms. Um, her, her ortho was completed 
Um, uh, uh, no, that, that's incorrect. Uh, it, what, her ortho was completed five years ago, and for the last two years, she has not worn her her retainers. So you would expect everything to settle in, right? So this is how she presents. I'm a little out of focus in the back, but um, this is a great result. You know, her midlines are on. I don't see any wear, no inflammation in the gums. Like I said, zero cavities. A little bit of a chip there. Got a mammal on here, a mammal on here. So there's not a lot going on on this tooth or maybe on the edge of this tooth. These are her uh, periodontal probings. It's a good, healthy mouth. Now this is her T-scan results. Now, what I, wanna, what I want you to uh, appreciate is remember how in our first patient, how that was able to, they were able to sustain a good clinch and that black line was flat. She doesn't have a, a, a really steady black line. She can't sustain a clinch. And you can see that as a result of force, okay? The other thing is look at how much force hits in the front. You've got almost 40% of total bite forces on eight and nine. She hits there first. And as she clenches her teeth together, she brings them together, but she's, she's not, she's touching the promised land, but she, she's not in it. And, um, you know, she's just on the border, not really, not really dialed in at all. And so I bring, I bring mob back and say, Hey, this is, this is the concern that I have. Um, you know, what do we want to do about this? And mom's like, well, I thought we got the teeth. The bite was all taken care of. And eh, it's kind of a hard pill to swallow, you know, no, the teeth are straight. But unless you measure it, you don't know what you're going to get. And so this is where uh, T-Scan keeps you out of trouble, especially if you're doing, um, you know, clear aligners or you're doing some limited ortho. It's a great case finishing tool. And so, you know, one of the concerns is how long does it take this to go to this? <clears throat> this is somebody who's in their mid-50s, right? And we have all sorts of wear issues and ab fractions. This is not being maintained very well. Okay. Um, uh, Missy used to work for me at the time she was 30 years old. Uh, she is using a neuromuscular orthotic and she has headaches and migraines. She's had ortho completed twice done by two different providers and she's out of braces for uh, six years now. We'll just jump right to it. And even though she has what looks to be a really good finished product, uh, she is not balanced. She is heavy on the anterior left. You can see in all three of these bites, the left side is the problem side. And she's not off a little. She's off a lot. This is 70-30 down here. Okay. Renee, uh, I'm going to pick it on the ortho orthodontist a little bit here, but it doesn't really matter if it's ortho or you complete an arch or you complete a full mouth or you uh, insert cosmetics. Um, the bite force and the rules don't change. Um, Renee is a 45-year-old 40, 40 year female dentist. She's a general dentist, and um, she suffers from headaches and migraines. And she's had ortho done four times, done by four different providers. Never thought she was going to be out of pain. And so, uh, you know, pay attention to this side. I don't want to get into EMGs other than to say that she's really off the charts at 350 microvolts. But if you look at the distribution, she has um, basically 90% of total bite forces on the left. She's got a great smile, um, but her bite doesn't really come together under those rules that we talked about earlier, right? And here, she's not perfect. She's on her way to being there. Uh, it's a right lateral movement, and you expect when the she goes into right working, this canine is going to take over, and it's doing that, uh, right? But look at what the muscles are doing. Remember, she was at 350 here. Muscles are much more calm. 
what do you want to bet her uh, her migraines are better? And they are actually. So Ryan comes in and Ryan wants veneers. And um, he has a problem, uh, the chair side of composite veneers, he has a problem with uh, tooth number six continuing to pop off repeatedly. When I saw, um, when I saw Ryan, this is how he presented. Now, before you took patients' money and had uh, veneers popping off, wouldn't you want to know that you had all this bite force in the front? This is how he brings his teeth together in MIP. I would certainly want to address this first before I started having veneers pop off. Um, and in all three of these uh, bites, you see the same thing. About 80% uh, of the bite force is on the right side and that was 76.8 and consistently. So, I mean, this is something you can address before. Hey, Ryan, you know, before we do your veneers, we need to do ortho or we need to do some occlusal therapy if it's minor, although this doesn't appear minor to me at all. And um, uh, he ended up having uh, braces uh, first before, um, before we ended up redoing uh, uh, tooth number six. Another perio case, I'm gonna just skip that. All right, so here is a full mouth rehab um, uh, done uh, LVI style, neuromuscular with tens and uh, looks great. It's a good result. Midlines are on or just slightly off. And what I want you to appreciate is the cursor is at the tail end of the bite and as she, her teeth are coming apart you have these three teeth that are overloaded two three and six or uh and it's it's the it's it's pressure between two and 31 three and 30 and six and 27 right so any of those teeth can be any of those six teeth can be affected but as you move the cursor to the next bite, you can see it's the same three teeth, right? Move it to the next one, same three teeth. And what happens when these teeth are overloaded, right? You guys already know what all those things that were on that one sheet or that one slide, all those things that could happen. Well, she ends up... Um, meeting me at the door when I come into the office with a syringe in her hand and she's in tears and she's like, you're going to have to get me numb before I can even work. Uh, and so, you know, ended up opening a tooth um, during my, during my lunch, I had to open up 30, uh, which had an abscess. Remember the teeth that were overloaded? Two and 31, three and 30 and six and 27. They all three ended up getting root canals. She didn't want to have her bite adjusted. I'm like, you know, maybe we should, maybe we should adjust your bite and get this dialed in. No, 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 no. Don't touch my porcelain. I don't want you to touch my porcelain. I'm like, okay. So on, there's a Saturday that comes up, I get a call and she's freaking out. And she's like, I just broke a crown and I'm freaking out right now. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, what were you eating? And she says, oh, I was eating a hamburger. And, uh, well, that's not very hard. And um, my question was, is it 31, 30, or uh, 27? And here's 31, here's 30. And cubic zirconia core, very tough stuff with uh, an Emacs overlay. And it wasn't balanced that, uh, that great. And this is how she just discluded. I got uh, I got about five minutes here, and then we'll we'll stop for questions. So um, this is how she discluded. She discluded off of those uh, posterior teeth, and then once we adjusted the bite, you can see she's got good canine guidance because all the force goes in this direction, and all the force from the three other quadrants goes down to 100%, okay? All right, I'm going to I'm going to finish up with my implant failure which is uh, which is great. Uh, we're all restoring implants if you're not uh, placing them. 
Uh, you're certainly restoring them. So this is this X-ray is a check film. It's taken uh, 326 of 12 on a full mouth case that I inherited. Now, when I went to school, I was taught that uh, bone loss to the first thread was acceptable. I'm sure they're still teaching that. And you can see this is my bone level here. And the first thread is down here. First thread is down here. And this is my platform, right? So now it is six of 16. It's only been four years. And now my level of bone does this, okay? This implant is FUBAR. So this is my failure. And it's not my fault, but it is my problem. I'm responsible for this patient. And um, I did not take the T-scan. I was not, at the time, was not T-scanning all of my patients. So when you take a look at when, when she bites into her maximum intercuspation, take a look at all these numbers on the inside of the arch, right? What restoration is the most loaded? That is tooth 19. Tooth 19 opposes tooth 14. The implant is the most heavily loaded restoration in her mouth. And it doesn't matter which of the three bites you look at. It's still the most heavily loaded tooth, right? No canine guidance going to the right. And when she goes to the left, she's discluding off of the implant. This is no bueno. And so... Uh, another implant failure. I didn't place or restore this one, um, but I checked it once it got into uh, the patient's mouth to make sure we were going to have no repeats. There's my implant. Okay. All right. So a couple of things. Yeah. You may have a. Uh, a, um, a scanner and some of the reps will say, well, we have a, an occlusal feature. Uh, and I'm, it's great that we're gonna do a side-by-side -side comparison because here is a scanner and the red, by the way, indicates that there is good occlusion. Okay, that's what this means, all right? Here, red is not good, red is of high force, but I wanna show you the difference between what the algorithm for occlusion on a scanner means to versus uh, pressure, force pressure mapping and uh, bite timing. So I'm gonna play this. So when you actually have the patient bite down, it's a whole different thing. Like uh, this technology is telling you that the occlusion is good. No, nah, it's really not. T-scan is and uh, has been the gold standard for uh, occlusion and digital occlusion for years. And that is true. So if somebody is telling you, oh, if you just buy the scanner, you don't need a T-scan. And there are key opinion leaders out there saying that it's garbage. We measure these side by side on the same day, you get two separate results. Okay. So if you wanna learn more about this, I have two things for you. One is um, I do do in-office trainings with docs. And uh, here I'm in Texas, here I'm in Michigan, um, and, no, Pennsylvania, and here I'm in Michigan. So uh, I'm putting my cell number on here. You can text me or, or and my, my email again, you can email me if this is something you want uh, over the shoulder training. We go over three main things. How do I get good data? How do I interpret that data? And then how do I take that data and turn it into treatment? And you'll see me, I'm not doing the revisions. I'm just guiding these doctors on what they need to leave and what they need to take away, all right? And they're doing all the work. The second thing you can do, if you wanna know more about uh, T-Scan, obviously contact the reps, but there's a two-day course that's coming up, Robert Kirstein who's got 30 years experience uh, compared to my 10 with uh, the technology. And that's coming up at Vivos Institute, uh, February 17th and 18th. And if you wanna know how to register for that, you can reach me, reach out to me and I will give you the, I can send you the link 
uh, either on a text or an email. So at this point, we've got about 10 minutes. I'm going to turn it back over to Shane and um, stop sharing here, and we can answer any questions you guys have. Thank you, Dr. Sutter. Um, so if you guys have questions, like I said, put it into the question and answer uh, area, um, and we can answer your questions. So I, I have one question here is, how do you know exactly where on the clinical tooth you would need to adjust as the text scan just shows the approximate area? Good question. Yes, the short answer is you do know where to adjust. So, um, well, I can't, I can't share my screen. I gave that, that, that authority up. I was gonna show you where you could. So there's a green line or a blue line that goes right down the middle of the tooth. That's your central fossa of the lower cusp coming into the upper. And whether it's on the outside, that would be the buccal incline or the inside, of that line would be your palatal incline. And then of course, if it's at the front of the square, that would be mesial. And then if it's at the back of the square, that would be the distal aspect. So one of the things that you have to do uh, when you take uh, the bite registration is just line up that arch to fit the data. And you only have to do that once, your assistant can do that for you. Um, and then once you do it the one time in the beginning, it's good for that patient like forever. Good question. Okay, another question here is, how do you determine when you can adjust the patient's occlusion versus placing them in orthotic therapy? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, and it depends. Uh, if they're class two, um, not that adjusting the bite if a tooth is overloaded is not going to work. But I think most of dentistry has gone to, I'm going to put you into an orthotic because I don't know if this is occlusion. I don't know if this is a joint position or if the patient's overclosed. And the reality is when you put something in between the teeth, you actually change those three things, video, occlusion, and the joint orthopedic position. And so the argument for years has been, well, you know, put them in an orthotic first. I don't. Uh, and I'm sought out for this. I've done probably over 300 cases at this point. If most people, and I'm going to quote Dawson here, which I don't ever really do, um, but Dawson stated that TMD or TMJ didn't start with occlusion and it shouldn't end with occlusion either. And that's kind of a really wise um, old guard approach to take to it. So if somebody is class two and they're going to stay on their back teeth and you can't get, you know, anterior guidance to get them off the back teeth fast, I'd probably put them in an orthotic and then build that, build the timing into the plastic. But I make probably, I don't know, two to three orthotics per year. And I do DTR or occlusal adjustments, mm, probably 60 to 70 cases per year. So, um, and on a case that didn't work with DTR, I've got about seven cases out of um, 300 that I went back and made a neuromuscular orthotic and that didn't, after it was all said and done and they were dialed in, that didn't re resolve any of the pain either. So, you know, the bite and the stomatonathic system is only one reason why patients can have fa oral facial pain. The upper cervical complex, which we don't have any inkling of as dentists, that can cause pain and headaches too. So uh, your primary etiology is occlusion. Okay. How does T-scan differ for you on how you analyze it with a diagnostic patient versus a patient that you're doing a bite balance on? It doesn't um, because the first thing you have to do is do the diagnosis of, okay, Mrs. Jones, you know, like that, that first case I showed you where she was really high on um, 
32 and 31. And so you would let the patient be aware at that point that there's a concern. When the patient comes back in to actually do the treatment, I'm taking new data before I ever do any adjustments on that patient because it might have changed a little bit. Um, but every time the patient comes in for, let's say, a revision uh, uh, appointment, I start out with new data. And when I get to a, co a comfortable position where I, I like the, where the data is, I record it and save it. So I save the, the pre treatment and the post treatment and any of the adjustments in between. It's good to have, but uh, I don't save those. All you really need is where the patient started and where they began, uh, where they ended. Okay. Uh, another question here is most patients tend to develop a habitual bite occlusion to avoid a true premature contact or an interference. Will the tech scan show the true prematurity or the habitual prematurity? Yes, it does. And uh, you, what you might be hinting at is avoidance theory. And the reality is once you get that, um, once you get that prematurity out of the way, yeah, it's, it's, it's like balancing a chair, right? So if one leg of the chair is longer than the other, um, you know, you have to fine tune that. Now the mouth is not four legs. It's got 28 teeth. There's no way to get that mouth balanced without a computer. It's way too complex. And so one of the things that I think a lot of people do and may have struggled with is they think that just getting the bite 50-50 is good enough. No, you have to pay attention to the, the working and non-working interferences too. T-scan is also going to give you that. And once you free up the envelope of motion, um, crazy things happen for patients as far as muscle hyperactivity goes down, uh, range of motion goes up. You know, I mean, I mean, I'm talking about in the chair first visit. I'm not talking about you have to wait six months. Some patients you do. But just about everyone notices a benefit change that happens almost immediately. And the difference in what I'm talking about and what's been taught is what you see when I'm doing my adjustments with those muscles is I'm looking at a biophysiologic approach to occlusion. Occlusion is taught from a biomechanical standpoint. And if you follow the biomechanical standpoint, you will increase muscle hyperactivity. So group function is not ideal. It's accepted, it's common, but from a biophysiologic standpoint, it's no bueno. Okay, I know you're probably short on time here. So last question One more. would be, would be uh, how would you recommend someone to start implementing T-Scan into their practice? Yeah, so first you gotta buy one, okay? <laughs> That's the hard step is to convince yourself that this thing is going to make you money. And it does. But if you leave it on the, you know, it's like buying a, a DSLR uh, to take pictures of patients' teeth, but you never take it out of the box. So how I would implement this is buy it, do some of the online training with T-Scan, um, um, the engineers, the reps, whoever can kind of get you started. And um, then Bring your, bring your team in when you have downtime or pay them to come in for half a day and screen everybody, right? And um, that's probably where I would start. And if you've built appliances for patients and you're kind of scared about adjusting occlusion as a therapy, well, start adjusting the plastic then, right? I mean, that's a start. Um, and then also when you're delivering complex cases, you're doing a long span bridge, you better check right and left and you better check protrusion. Otherwise, cause I, I, I've been falling prey to that too. I'm like, oh, the bite's balanced. I checked right, I checked left. I didn't check protrusion. Bit me, I ended up doing a, a bridge over. And it's like, you're an idiot, you know better. Why, you shouldn't be doing stuff like that. Um, and then, um, you know, anything that you're delivering and then work backwards. It's, it's too big to say, okay, look, we're going to just start by taking um, 
T-scan data on every single patient that walks into my office. That's a great end goal. And it's, it, it really serves your patient population uh, holistically, right? Because you're already going to check the perio. You're already going to check um, uh, decay. Um, but the other thing that it does is when I have full mouth cases, and I've got a number of them, or cosmetics, once a year, I'm putting the T-scan uh, sensor in their mouth and I'm getting a reading because I would much rather adjust something than replace it, especially at my fees, what I charge patients um, to do the level of work at which I think I'm, I'm valued. So, uh, and most of my patients have seen it, they get it. And in fact, um, a lot of them can read a T-scan better than most dentists. So um, I think there's great value to incorporating this. I would also I would also put it in, uh, in on your web page that you offer this as a as a as a service for patients to make sure the bite's right, you know, to make sure that your crowns aren't going to be dis uncomfortable or, um, you know, bring the patient discomfort. If you look on my website, uh, there's a technology page that shows everything that we have and the reason why we have them. And I have more toys than most. There's no question. I love toys. I love data. But I would say that's how I would implement it and get it started. And when you're really like, all right, look, I know enough to be dangerous, but I really want to, uh, you know, hone my skills. You can bring me into your office. You can bring Robert Kirstein into your office. You can attend uh, one of the, the courses that we do, uh, the DTR courses, live patient. We do it and I wear a, a, a loop cam, a camera on my loops. So you see everything that I see and all the adjustments and um, that'll bring you another step. But, you know, it's interesting because I always think you need a good coach. I look back to, to, to pre-clinic and how many crowns did you cut before you actually got turned loose on a patient, right? And while a handpiece is a small piece of technology, if somebody just gave it to you and said, hey, this is, this is how you use it over time you would figure it out and you would excel and you would get benefit, not the kind of benefit and not at the speed at which you have an instructor standing in your office and you're doing patient after patient after patient. We don't just do one, we do five or six. And um, at the end of that day, you are confident and you're seeing the same results I am. So all of this stuff can be taught. No, I didn't come out of dental school knowing it all, but. Yeah, and I would add to, to that, because um, I get that asked a lot about how to start using T-scan practices. I think any time you're going to touch a patient, like do some kind of treatment, whether it be a filling, whether it be a crown, whatever you're going to do on those patients, it's always good to have that diagnostic scan before you touch those patients, because it allows the patients to own their own occlusal scheme yes. that they come in with but also allows you to have conversations with those patients about maybe some other needs that might arise uh, as well too. So that's a good, it's a good place that's gonna save you some headaches as well too, if you start using them diagnostically, but it's also gonna help you get more comfortable with T-scan faster as well too. Hey Shane, if I can, one thing on ROI, because this is, it's called work for a reason. Yep. We don't, when none of us are doing this for a hobby. so. One of the questions I get, and I didn't address that in this, uh, this webinar, is what is my ROI on this? And the answer is, it depends on how you use it, right? So the first five years that I owned uh, uh, my T-scan, I had a total uh, production increase of 87,000 over those five years. Now, that more than paid for itself. However, after I had in-office training, T-Scan was responsible for about 500, uh, I'm sorry, $100,000 worth of extra production to my, to my uh, office. And it has maintained six figures over the last seven or eight years. It's never dropped below that. So, I mean, I wish all of dentistry could say, oh, if you just invest, you know, Ten or eleven thousand dollars, and I have no idea what the cost of it is now because I bought mine a long time ago. But I could get a hundred thousand dollars back 
there's not a there's not a dentist in the world that wouldn't write that check okay but there is some nuances to it how do we get you confident how do we get you to where you're not afraid of the technology or to adjust occlusion because one of the interesting things that's happened to me over the last five years is I'm seeing more and more dentists as patients who had a full mouth or a full arch or some cosmetics done and their stuff is breaking and no one's talking about it. And when you put them in the chair and you put them on the machine, it's it, it again, that first visit, it's like, oh my gosh, this feels so amazing. Yeah, that's what it should be. And that's what the treating doctor probably thought they achieved. But if you don't measure it, you're guessing. I've already said that more than once. So um, yeah, for what it's worth. If you, you guys wanna... have questions later, later on, uh, you've got my email, you've got my uh, Facebook. Oh. You can reach out to me. I'm pretty, I'm pretty available. Uh, are you able to put that back up, the uh, email? And, uh, are you able to share your screen at all? So, yeah, or oh, no? sure. Let's Just see Just in here. case they want to see it one last time. Right, can you see it now? I know some have asked about the prices and stuff. I would just email Dr. Sutter um, or call him or text him about the pricing for the one-on-one -on -one in office the training. One-on-one -on -one training? Yep. Yeah. You'll make that up in the, the first week. Once you know how to what to do, how to say it, the verbiage to use with patients. Um, now, this is Dean Hutto in Baytown, Texas. Uh, this is Alexander George in, uh, Pittsburgh and, um, Christina. Oh my gosh. She's going to beat me. She's right outside of Detroit. I can't remember her last name, she but there, if you want references, there's a number of docs that would be like, yeah, I totally changed my practice. I'd be happy to let you speak to any of them. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate your time today, Dr. Sutter, and I'll say everybody that's uh, attending this. Like you said, if you have any questions, you can email Dr. Sutter, you can text him. Um, Absolutely. Call him, I guess, too, if you want. Um, there, you can also email your reps as well. We can get you in touch with whatever you want. But hopefully you guys enjoyed this, uh, this session, and we look forward to talking to you more in the future. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you having me.